Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. I have a friend calling in from Montana. He has a very interesting story he wrote a book about when he lived in L.A. His name is Raphael Moscatel. Welcome, Raphael. How are you doing today, man? I'm well, John. Thank you for having me on your podcast. So this must have hit really at home, obviously, uh, being adopted and, and, and going through this process and uncovering a lot of information you didn't expect to uncover. What was it like when you first got the first bit of information that kind of made you rethink who you were? That's a great question because it kind of goes to the heart of the book of, uh, you know, nature versus nurture. I was uh, had just turned 30 and my parents had told me kind of a series of fibs over the years that I document in the book. Um, and when I learned of it, I, I kind of stumbled upon it. And I'll tell you that a little bit later. But how I felt was just it was like an out of body of ex experience. Um, we were joking uh, before we got started here about the fact that my name is Raphael. And so I was I was raised by Spanish uh, Sephardic Jews. Um, and it turns out I'm German. So going back and finding out that I'm actually not a Sephardic Jew, uh, you know, what why was my name Raphael? What was real about me? What was I modeling myself after? It was, it's, it, it'd been quite of an ex experience at the time. So I went down to the corner store, got a six pack of Peroni and, uh, you know, just knocked myself out. The next day I kind of woke up and started evaluating what had happened and, and. Since then, I've, I've just kind of been putting the pieces back together and uh, wrote this book to uh, uh, for other kind of late discovery adoptees to see what it was like. So did you look different than mom and dad? I mean, what, you know, when you thought they were your mom and dad, did you look a little different? There's no blue eyes in my family. My father's 6'3", I'm 5'9", uh, being honest. And no, I didn't look anything like them. They came actually through Spain, then Turkey, then Greece. We had a, a family portrait on the piano of all these gentlemen in Turkish fezes, and I don't look a thing like them, John. They treated me so so much like family; it would have never, it really never occurred to me. And uh, my mother was able to kind of keep a lid on it for for that long. Nobody dare cross her and tell me the truth. So uh, so uncovering it was quite a shock. What was the information you got? Well, my, originally my mother had uh, gone ahead and she had she had lost a, a son in 1976. He died in a car accident. And in the beginning of the story, I talk about being at the funeral uh, for, a, for a, a friend of mine and his father was an attorney who knew my mother. And at the time that my brother died, he felt very very badly for my mother. He saw how wrecked she was with the tragedy of her son's death. And he took part in kind of engineering an adoption uh, for, my, for my mother. And that's kind of how this came about. And he sealed the adoption records pretty, pretty good. My mother took photographs of herself pregnant. Uh, with a balloon under her under her uh, you know dress to make sh make it look like that uh, that I was adopted and any time I asked I was just rebuffed and rebuffed and then there was kind of a breakthrough when I came home one year uh, from school and we lived on Beverly Drive which was right across the street from a family called the Osbournes and that was Ozzy and Sharon Osborne and they happened to be our neighbors my father. He had gone along with my mother and told me the story. One day we got in an argument. He threw me out of the car. And when I came home, uh, two police were at his, at, at our, at our doorstep. And he had seen this man who was wearing purple bifocals and kind of waving his hands all weird and dressed in black in front of the house. And in Beverly Hills, that just kind of wasn't a common occurrence. And so he called the police on him. He thought he was a vagrant. The police showed up and said, no, you know, that's just that's just your new neighbor, Ozzy Osbourne. And uh, my father didn't know who that was. But the next day, uh, his wife, Sharon, showed up with the two children, uh, Kelly and Jack. And they came into our home and were, were talking to us. And we were just kind of making friends with our new neighbors. It's an odd way to kind of meet your neighbors. But and she kind of observed that there uh, was an age difference. And she asked my mother if I was uh, my mother's grandson. My mother was offended because she had kind of, you know, told me I was her son. And at that point, they uh, kind of changed their, uh, you know, their story, my origin story and said, well, you're a test tube, babe. And that's that's to explain, you know, why we, we, we share so many years apart. And I just kind of bought it. it. I thought about it for a bit. And I, I guess deep down, John, I didn't want to believe it. And so I kind of packed it in the back of my head and, and kind of forgot about it for a while. And then years later, I stumbled on some news that kind of broke that 
open and told me that that was a falsehood. What was the news? Well, I had come down to Los Angeles and picked up a newspaper at the Standard Hotel, and I was meeting with a literary agent. When I came back, I was sitting in my chair in San Francisco where I used to live, and uh, I opened the newspaper to an article about Louise Brown, and she was the first test tube baby. Um, she was born in England, and it was around 19... I want to say it was, it was 1975. And my birth was 1977, so this got me thinking that my mother didn't kind of uh, give me the right information. So I called my father and he couldn't get his story straight. And my mother got on the phone and I said, you know, I'm not a test tube baby because this lady was born two years before me and she was very upset. And uh, she told me, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about and that it was done under the, you know, hush hush and not to ask any questions. And at that point I knew. So I wrote a letter to the state of California. And uh, about six months later, I got this manila envelope um, with about 25 pages of redacted documents and that just ended up blowing my mind uh, what was in them. As these tables start to turn and you start to discover this information, what, what's your relationship right now with your parents? Well, my father passed in July of this last year, but um, my relationship with my mother is wonderful. And it was with my father. I, you know, we, can't, we went through a lot of turmoil uh, because I said, you know, why would you lie to me about something like this? I spent 30 years, you know, pursuing ambitions and dreams that I don't even know really were in me and in, in my biology and in who I was. And a lot of that time felt like it like it had been wasted or burned. And so while I had a kind of a new lease on life, and that's how I've, you know, looked at it going forward, I was real pissed. You know, I was really upset with her. I don't want to talk to her ever again. And I started doing a little bit of thinking about my brother who had died a couple years before. And, you know, now that I have children, I have two boys and I have a daughter, um, you know, it helps me understand how bad it could be to lose a child. Um, and my mother, you know, when she lost uh, her son, her first son, she just didn't want to take that risk ever again. And ultimately, I learned that, you know, the bonds that we have between us, what family is, it, it goes well beyond the bloodline. That's an interesting thing. And um, I was talking to my wife about that. And I think a lot of people in families, too, let's say if you have the same dad, different mothers, type of kid type of situation you know a lot of times those kids don't hang out with each other you know you know what i mean because they had a different mother when you think about that you think about there's a different tone right because we you know once we establish ourselves and we have certain sensibilities we have a certain tone and a lot of times those kids that have different mothers even though they had the same father they don't have a similar tone and i think families beat themselves up. Did you ever feel like you didn't have the same tone as, as your parents and as this family? In a, in a way, it was like that. You know, I live in Montana now. And, you know, I one of the songs that we play in my truck when we're driving down the road is Family Tradition. And I don't know if you're familiar with that song, but, uh, it, you know, he's talking about how he kind of broke the family tradition. And I, I do feel that I took a different path in a lot of ways. I was very different, but, you know, I, and I was laughing about this with my sister. I said, you know, so much stuff going on today with, you know, identity. I said, I identified as a Sephardic Jewish person. And, you know, it's kind of strange, you know, that they, they've played off this kind of thing for a while, like in the jerk Steve Martin and how he's raised early on in the, in the show. But I really believed it. I mean, I, I kind of acclimated to that 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 family feel but i did feel a little bit distant in that way and then coming around to that was a little bit difficult but you know in a way i'm just glad it happened uh when it did and i didn't go my whole life without knowing that would have been interesting to me to just kind of die without that knowledge which actually i think a lot of people do john um mm -hmm. there's many in doing the research for this book too i just learned that so many more people are adopted than you would imagine i read a blurb in there about an actor being involved and how was that part of mr landon being involved in this yeah so i've had a chance to kind of talk with a lot of people who uh who love michael landon and a lot of his fan groups because there was a book about him that didn't say really nice things. And my, my book isn't about that. But my mother and uh, his wife had a very close relationship. They started off as actresses in Hollywood on the set of Bonanza, which was his first show. And him and my father, Raymond, became the closest friends. I mean, they were like blood brothers, very tight. And in 1976, when my brother died, my family was at a taping of Little House on the Prairie at the Paramount Studios. And my brother uh, was killed 
crossing a, a street in Los Angeles. They didn't have cell phones back then, John. So a call came into the studio and uh, my mother just howled, bellowed, you can imagine. She didn't know he was dead, but she knew something was really awful. And um, they were with the Landons and they went down to the... Uh, the emergency room, uh, you know, down, uh, I believe it was at uh, UCLA and he was dying there. And, uh, my sister, uh, came in and she, uh, sh she was slamming the elevator door trying to get in to go see her brother because her brother was dying. And when the elevator doors opened, uh, she saw Michael Landon and my father embracing. And at that moment, she knew that her, her brother was dead. Um, and then Michael Landon named the character Albert Ingalls after after my brother Albert. So they were all very close throughout the seventies and into the eighties. And then, and Michael actually gave me my, my nickname some years later when we were together. I mean, the, the unveiling of this information is, did he play a part in that at all? Or No, he, uh, he didn't in that, in, in that case, but you know, I had to basically try to understand where I came from. So my middle name was Albert. I was given the middle name after my brother. And the book talks a lot about kind of living in the shadow of your siblings. And so whenever I saw that show come on and, you know, it, it, it was syndicated and it was a very popular show, Little House on the Prairie, I'd see Albert, the character, and it would always remind me of somebody I could never be. So that played a lot of, a lot into my psychology, you know, of who I was and who I was supposed to be. Um, and over the years, our families were very close, but my mother uh, kind of ran the family with an iron fist and nobody you know, whether it was Michael Landon and there's many other people in the book that knew about it would dare open their mouth or say anything. Although I suspect some felt very guilty about it and wanted to. Um, and I describe a scene in, in the book where uh, we're in Hawaii with the Landons and he calls me close to him and he gives me, I have these big buck teeth when I'm a kid and he calls me Bucky. And I could kind of get a sense there that things were not right. But again, they all treated me like family. And so it was it was quite a wonderful time, really. And I wanted to reflect that and I wanted to represent that in the book. As you're walking through this process and living in LA, did you want to be a writer? You said you were being a lit agent, what aspirations did you have uh, while you're experiencing this? Yeah, I originally, when I went into school, I had aspirations to be an actor and a writer. I had a, a terrible case of cystic acne and it uh, devastated my face, just mutilated every inch and corner of my face. And uh, I was discouraged from kind of moving forward in that in that way. But my mother uh, and father were not industry people. So we came from a family of doctors. My parents wanted to push me into law or medicine or, or something like that. So part of that initial resentment, you know, that you were talking about earlier in our conversation, um, I directed towards my mother uh, because I just felt, you know, maybe she should have nurtured that aspect of me. Um, but by hiding this creative piece of me, it, it kind of inhibited me. And I come to find out that I came from a, a very creative group of people uh, who gave me up for adoption. So that kind of made the sting a little bit tougher, but it all shook out in the end. You started discovering this new family. What was, what was this new family that gave you up for adoption? What was their deal? Well, you know, they, I received a manila envelope in the mail because in some states they don't allow you to find out who you're adopted uh, given up by adoption you know what family and who's involved and they'll redact heavily all the paperwork so i was looking at a lot of information but i couldn't find the names and i hired i, I saw a documentary on vh1 about run dmc because the rapper uh, uh daryl mcdaniels had been adopted I hired the woman who found out who, you know, his his family was. And I remember her telling me, Raphael, just sit down for a second. I got to tell you the craziest story. And uh, I sat down in my chair and uh, she said, I, I found out who who the who the people whose names are redacted. She said, your grandfather um, was a composer and he wrote a very famous uh, song called The Addams Family. It blew my mind. And I thought it was the Munsters, John. So I, I said, oh, well, you know, I, I love. Herman and Eddie. And then she said, no, 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 no. And she kind of hummed the notes to me. And I said, oh, wow. And his wife as well was a big radio singer. And so I, I started doing some research on them and, and that kind of took, took its own winding path as well. So did you, did you meet up with them? And I had actually run into my grandfather at the Beverly Hills hotel when I didn't even know who he was. And, uh, I, I used to go over there 
to, to have a drink because my, my house was right across the street. And I went in there one day and I saw him and he looked at me real hard. We kind of, he sensed something, um, but it wasn't, it kind of wasn't an explicit thing. And so I did meet him that one time, but my parents went to see him at one of his signings and he was, he, he acted as if he had made some deal with the devil. He was overcome with the fact that he felt like this piece of his past was coming back to haunt him. Um, and he didn't live much longer after he learned the news of that. I did get to meet my grandmother as well. She was on her deathbed in Harlem. She was a radio singer in the, in the thirties, very popular. And I, I do feel she was waiting for me, John, to come and see her and meet her. Um, my, birth, my birth mother died on my birthday when I was about 18. So I didn't get a chance to meet, to meet all of them. So it was bittersweet, but that usually is the case with adoptees. Um, in many cases, it really doesn't work out when you go back to meet the family, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Well, it's funny you mentioned Daryl McDaniels. I uh, I had a project with him called Back in the Day. Uh, it was me, Rob Weiss, and then this buddy, Nate Blonde. Um, and I thought it was a no-brainer. I remember we went to the Chateau Marmar and had dinner, and I thought it was a great project. But this is weird how connections are. And then when I lived in New Jersey, uh, I lived in North Caldwell, New Jersey, for 12 and a half years. He was in, I think, Orange or uh, West Orange or somewhere like that. So it's a very, very, very small world. I mean, what's your thoughts na now and what are you trying to do now with yourself and, and career? You moved to Montana. What's going yeah. on there? Well, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, that's another famous country song and, uh, you know, from uh, one of my favorite country stars, but, uh, we, we came out here to live a better life for the children, John, really. The um, quality of life seemed to be diminishing at an accelerated pace in Los Angeles. It wasn't the, the life that we remembered. And um, I had come out here one day during COVID and I just flew in by accident, uh, took a look and I said, God, I could really learn a lot from the people out here. I, you know, I'd, I'd been a city boy my whole life and um, never really liked the way that a lot of people look down on people in the country. I didn't want that from my children. I wanted to kind of live a, I don't know, more regular life. And, you know, in the book too, just uh, as a non sequitur, it's kind of like a Forrest Gump book. So the celeb, it's not a tell all book about celebrities. And I knew this person and I knew that person. It's, it's really talking about who they were at their core, you know, getting back to Michael Landon, it's like, you know, little house on the prairie. That was the, the, the figure I had my, my uh, head of how I wanted my kids to live you know, closer to nature and with a different set of values. So that's why we're out here. Well, if you watch Yellowstone, it'll make you want to move out there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it depends on which family you want to be with. Uh, I mean, you know, in terms of uh, the, the storyline and the developers, I'll tell you that is, it is really the case. I mean, they're, I'm a capitalist, but you know, to develop at this pace, it's a shame. The, it's it's unfettered growth without any control. And uh, it's hard to see a beautiful part of the country kind of get ripped up like that. So Yellowstone's got a lot of truth to it, for, for sure. Is it cold? Because you're close to Canada, right? It can get really cold down here. I wouldn't suggest anybody from L.A. move here if, uh, you know, and I'm probably saying that with a wink and a nod because I don't we don't really want people <laughs> moving up here. But it can get very cold and it's winter, you know, Seven months out of the year but right now we're about to get our boat in the lake cool off and uh, it, the winter makes those warm months just all all the more awesome like a bear coming out of hibernation and, and going back to michael landon i i kind of always thought about him because i kind of you know i developed i don't know a thousand shows sold three I, I got pissed off at the industry and i taught myself how to do everything you know because i started out music videos and so forth and and i looked around and saw 50 people doing nothing so i said shit i should just teach myself how to do everything and and that's how i was able to build my business because i taught myself how to shoot a camera how to edit uh do everything and it really eliminates and i i heard that michael landon was a workhorse and did everything was he really really that good and that creative yes he was and he you know he start, had started off as a carpenter and people think that just because he was and he was you know one of the most handsome people in hollywood they they thought well things just come easy to him and it was not the case um you know he lived as pretty well documented that he had a very difficult childhood and he was a perfectionist on set and he knew how to do everything from the camera work to the editing he wrote the scripts and you know he built an empire you know when that wasn't really a thing 
I mean, people had done it, but, but it was incredible what he did, you know, going from Bonanza to Little House on the Prairie to Highway to Heaven. It, it's no coincidence that each one of those were number one shows consistently. Um, there have been people who say he was really tough on set, but that's kind of, I think, the nature of it um, when you're that dedicated. And he, uh, he brought up a lot of people, you know, a lot like, for example, this, uh, the lady who's written a story about him and um, uh, his wife from Little House on the Prairie, you know, there were things he said in the 70s that might have been, they sound inappropriate now, but, you know, in the big picture of it, she wouldn't have been anywhere with him. He he created a wonderful life for her and, and all the people around him, the people who worked on the set and everything. And I write in the book, he was never rude to anybody. Uh, outside of the set, whether when he was going around, he was a normal guy. He'd come over to my dad's house and, you know, hook up a washer. He'd mow our lawn. Uh, he was real down to earth when it came to it. But on set, you know, you're making a product and you better be on top of it. And sometimes people's feelings get hurt. You moved to Montana and, um, you know, you got this book out. And, and what is your aspirations and your goals? And with the, in the creative space? You know, in the creative space, I'd like to kind of add a different flavor to the narrative that we have. I, I was mentioning before we, you know, got cut off there that uh, people are really inhibited in terms of how they feel and about certain subjects. And um, my book talks a little bit about cancel culture as well. One of the characters, and it was one of the first victims, first targets, I should say, because he had some culpability, I'll admit. But I want people to feel comfortable with that. And I couldn't real, really feel comfortable with myself unless I put that out there. We got a number one spot on Amazon for pop culture music and adoption. But ultimately, I want people to really draw from the book, draw their experiences. And I've been getting great feedback, people reaching out to me from all different areas of society tell me how it's impacted them and honestly john that's the best reward i can have one last question uh, your mom and dad's jewish family what what type of spirituality um do you do now is that something in your life are you you know what's what's going on there yeah you know we we belong to a wonderful uh, church here uh, in Big Fork, Montana. My pastor is actually reading the book right now. I don't know if he's going to like it because we were a Jewish family that converted to Christianity while we were in Beverly Hills. And Michael Landon's wife is the, is the person who kind of turned us onto that. My father didn't make the journey with us. And we have a scene in the book where uh, there's a baptism and my father rejects the baptism. And it's fu it's a funny scene, but it's um, it, he just diverged from that perspective. Me, I can't imagine a life without faith and without God. And, uh, you know, raising my children without it, I can't imagine. Uh, it might be for some people, but for my wife and I, it centers our life. I've never been happier. So definitely having that experience in the book talks a lot about faith and God in the modern world and how you achieve that. It's it's really at the center. It's it's changed my life. And, and how old are your kids? And does you, is your wife in the business? Uh, my wife is not in the business. She's an attorney. So she's oh, a, okay. she does First Amendment uh, freedom of speech work up here in Montana um, and a lot of other business and transactional work. I got a, I've been up since 4 a.m. because we're doing potty training. And so I got a little one driving me crazy. It's, you don't see the bags under my eyes been a long night. Um, and then I got an 11 year old and an eight year old little girl and they're just, you know, light my life. So if anybody's looking for this book and, and in a similar situation as Raphael Moscatel, where would, where would we, I'm just laughing, looking at you, laughing at the name. Where, where's, where they find the book at? Okay. The book is at Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Amazon's the best place to get it. There's an audible version with a great uh, actor named Ryan Haugen who tells the story. It's, it's a short short narration, about five and a half hours. But it's uh, anybody who likes stories about families and dysfunctional families and, you know, seeing how things come out in the end, shake out and turn out all right, is going to like it. So I'd, I'd say go to Amazon and pick it up. I can't advertise it because it's got the title Bastard in it, which is profanity, according to uh, some people. Mm -hmm. So, um, but unfortunately, I can't advertise it. But if you search for Bastard of Beverly Hills, it's going to come up. I appreciate you coming on the show. And I think it was a definitely interesting story. And I think people could definitely relate if they've been in that situation before. So thanks for coming on the show. This has been Raphael Moscatel. And I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm -hmm.